Well, welcome to Review the Forum 3, and thank you very much for coming to my presentation and to listening to what I have to say today. Today I'm going to talk about information systems. Basically, information systems have three functions, to inform, to control, and to record. And I'm basically going to talk about the way they, that information systems relate to rebreathers, to closed circuit rebreathers. I'm going to be talking about uh, our industry direction in comparison to various other industries. So I'm not going to talk about any existing systems today. I'm, I'm much more interested in the designs of the future. I'll be talking about very, how technology has uh, been applied in various industries over history and how what that looks like compared to the uh, um, uh, rebreather industry. First of all, I wanted to consider what our goals are with information systems for rebreathers. And, and clearly the, the, there are two goals. One is to maximize the capability for the target diver. And the second is to minimize risk as much as possible, as much as practical. And, and, and it's clear, of course, from this event today, there are the, the various different speakers, that there are a number of different target divers that have uh, uh, different requirements for rebreathers. The other thing that's pretty clear to me is that capability is not something we really need to work on very much. Uh, the rebreathers now, barring a, a few strange people like Harry and some others that are trying to go to 200 meters and more, um, the, I think that uh, capability is something that we've already got. Depth and time, uh, we can do as much as we want as, as, uh, now. So really, our goals now are to minimize risk, and that's the big thing that, that's going to move the industry forward. Now, you'll notice that I said minimize risk rather than eliminate risk. Risk is always going to be present in our life. It's just part of life. Um, we all know how to eliminate the risk from diving. Don't dive. It's simple. But we don't want to do that. We want to continue to uh, accept some risk. How much risk is acceptable? Well, we'll actually put up with really bad outcomes uh, if it's rare enough. For example, uh, the NHTSA estimates that five children are strangled by power windows in cars each year. Of course, there are people who are trying to improve on that situation, but there's no outcry to take power windows out of cars. In fact, it's getting harder and harder to buy a car without power windows nowadays. So we do accept risk. <clears throat> Another characteristic of risk for people in this room is that risk is also personal because a lot of us have had friends die uh, on rebreathers. And I, I remember the night we found out about Penny Glover. Um, and it just took our breath away how, how that could happen to such a skilled, uh, careful diver. So how much can we reduce risk? And the answer is, I don't know. We don't have a lot of good data available. That I, I can see that there are several themes here that we're gonna, that, that we're gonna see over and over again, and that's another one of them. We, we really don't have good data. And so it makes it very hard without knowing exactly what the problems are, knowing how much we can reduce the risk. But I'm convinced we can re reduce it somewhat. So how, I'm going to look at one item here, a uh, steam boiler. Steam boilers were a powerful force in industrialization in the 1800s. And in the early days, their safety record was terrible. They had 159 boiler explosions in the 1880s alone. One explosion on the Sultana killed 1,500 people. That year, the American Society of Mechanical Engineers was formed, coincidentally. The, um, and uh, they formed their organization, first of all, as just a group, uh, a place to, to do uh, information exchange and, and for social reasons. Obviously, it's come a long way. The risk of exploding steam boilers now has been re reduced to vir virtually zero. And of course, every time I talk about, or I think about uh, rebreathers, I think about train wrecks. The reason for that, though, is that trains are actually the beginning of functional safety. It was one of the first systems, places where people realized there were great risks and systematic, uh, um, systematic processes could reduce that risk. But I think we'll be pretty surprised by, by some of the early days. I don't think people are aware. In the early days, they started out with open trains. They, and the problem with this is that people riding the trains brought their model of the world with them. 
and the mental model of how trains would work. And basically the mental model they had was the stagecoach. An early problem with trains was people would just step off them to get their hat or to, or to uh, you know, they'd be by going by their farm and they'd just step off the train. And people were being killed this way because the mental model they had of the automation was wrong. They didn't know how different it was going to be to step off a, a moving train going 10 miles per hour, that is like a stagecoach, versus 25 miles per hour. Because on a stagecoach, you can do it. Horses uh, trot at about 10 miles per hour, and it's quite reasonable for you to jump off and get your hat. So, and, and at this time, there really were no vehicles that went 25 miles per hour, so they just didn't have a good mental model. Uh, so the solution seemed obvious. Oops, I've gone one too far. Uh, the solution seemed obvious that what they would do would be, you know, build train cars and lock people in it. And that mitigation seemed to work quite well until the catastrophe of Moudon, when 55 people were burned alive, uh, locked securely in their new freshly painted train car. So they did some good things with the early trains. They put uh, they put in two tracks, so there'd be a track north and a track south, and that was a good idea. But because they didn't have any signaling systems, they just used time to decide how to schedule trains. So when a, when a train had been gone from the station long enough, they would just put another train on. And they really had no way of knowing whether the first train was gone or not. It gets worse, is if the first train is overdue at the other station, they then send out a train to try and help it. <laughs> this is the way they did things. And I, the only thing I've got to say is, thank God they only went 25 miles an hour. And of course, now all the problems are solved on trains and all the passengers ride safely now. Up to this point, I've been talking about passenger safety, but this was a very dangerous place to work as well. As you can see from the chart, the, 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 the carnage, uh, the, these deaths and injuries to rail injuries to, to rail workers would be completely unsupportable in today's society. But that was the situation then. And that situation has changed radically. But one of the things I'd like to draw your attention to is the operate, operator negligence. Well, I'm sure that some of these accidents were, you know, drunken workers or other people that were being very negligent. I bet you a large number of them were the result of human beings doing their best in a difficult situation with dangerous automation. After a careful analysis uh, of the nature of the accidents, it became clear that the coupling gear was a major player in accidents. The introduction of automatic coupling systems as a result of legislation greatly reduced the number of deaths. It also made railway workers much harder to identify because previously they'd been quite easy to identify by their missing fingers. When the data was analyzed, um, appropriate actions can be taken. Okay, so, so now I'm going to switch to another area of safety, and this has been touched on by other people. Uh, the idea of uh, general aviation. So. The, the beginning pilot flies with what's called visual flight rules, and they're allowed to uh, get a, a common training upgrade they would get as instrument flight rules. And that allows you to fly where you can't see where you're going. Visual flight rules require you to be able to see where you're going. And it's obviously a good idea to not have beginning pilots flying where they can't see where they're going. So there was a rule made that they had to have 200 hours before they could take uh, their instrument training. In 1974, the NTSB published a study with a statistical summary of pilots and the pilots most likely to be involved in fatal weather-related accidents. That pilot would have had between 100 and 299 hours. Further analysis led to the suggestion that since inexperienced pilots seem to be getting into advanced situations while they were building time to be able to qualify for IFR training, it would be a good idea to reduce the time required. There, although there are still training requirements, there is no longer any minimum time to get your IFR training. So we have a situation here of a rule that seemed obvious but was, and was intended to reduce accidents, but in, uh, in, in the end ended up increasing accidents and increasing fatalities. 
the IFR training restrictions were wrong. They were based on an assumption rather than knowledge. The message here is that you don't know what you don't know. There is no substitute for analysis of actual data. So is this situation unusual? Is it normal for an industry to struggle with safety? Here's another example, uh, the automobile industry. This is a trillion dollar business that's been around for 200 years and it's taken a long time to get to the point of safety. On the first cars, bumpers were an option. They weren't included. In Canada, mandatory seatbelt legislation is only 1976. And now we're talking about seatbelts. I also want to talk about risk homeostasis. I would like to introduce the topic, yeah, but, uh, the concept that human beings have a stable tolerance for risk. They adjust their behavior in various situations in order to keep the perceived risk below a comfortable level. There are some who argue that seat belts, the effectiveness of seat belts is less than is assumed. And you know, I'm, I want to be clear here, nobody's saying that seat belts don't help if you are involved in an accident, clearly they do. But there are some studies that say if you give people seat belts, they drive faster because of their risk thermostat. If this is true, it may have an effect on rebreather safety. Oh, I, I'd like to clarify why I'm talking about these experiences. It isn't to imply that you know, somehow we shouldn't worry about it because these, these sorts of uh, problems occur in other people as well. Um, it's just that I'm trying to put some context into, into what's happening with, with rebreather divers and, and that there is a process that will, that will happen. The prevention of fatalities needs to be a, a primary goal as rebreathers move into the main stream of diving. There are two obvious ways to create safer systems. In new systems, you have no choice but to predict the risks, analyze them, and then design ways to mitigate those risks. On a brand new technology, that's the only way to do it because no one really knows what the risks are. And as we've seen, often the predicted risks are not the most important risks or significant risks are, are missed. As technology matures, we would expect to see, we expect to collect accident data. We'd then analyze the accident data, determine the root cause of the, of the risks and, and provide mitigations for them. We would expect to see this as an iterative improvement in risk, uh, risk mitigation as more is learned about accidents and why they're occurring. We would expect to learn which mitigations are working and which ones aren't. We would create technology to then mitigate them better or, or cheaper. Of course, with rebreathers, in spite of them being in use for decades, there is very little credible data, civilian data, on root cause of fatalities. At present, most of the accident analysis and, and most of the design of, of mitigations is done by a small group of people who have informal experience with rebreather fatalities. So, what causes rebreather deaths? Some of them we know for sure. Obviously, uh, a lot of them are medical. Uh, David said earlier as many as 30% could be medical. Um, we know that they're all also, um, also caused by uh, inattention and carelessness, there is some component of that, and I, I certainly know of some that, that were the, the result of just some very bad decisions. But there's a lot we don't know. What's the ratio between hypercapnia, hypo, hyperoxia, and hypoxia? Uh, is a bail bailout valve better than a, a dive surface valve? Is electronic better than a manual CCR or a manual CCR with adaptive automation or a, a hybrid CCR? And one of the things I've noticed that's been mentioned by somebody else is that the full face masks were strongly recommended at Rebreather Forum 2, yet they really haven't been adopted. It's very unusual to see one. Why are people still dying of hypoxia? Manufacturers don't have good data on accident causes, and that makes effective engineering more challenging. Although virtually every rebreather on the market has data logging capabilities, these logs are not routinely shared or analyzed. Shearwater engineers would not normally see a log from a fatality where our computer was on that, on that diver. We would like to see these logs so that we can look for mitigations that could have been provided. We could have 
possibly broken the accident chain, but we never actually get to see the data, so we really don't know. And of course, that would still only be part of the picture. We would really like to see uh, uh, an analysis of the accident that included medical, uh, mechanical, and physical devices. We'd like to see root cause. From my limited point of view of the world, here are some of the reasons why we don't have root cause analysis of rebreather accidents, and again, some of them have already been touched on. In some cases, there is no specific requirement to investigate. The investigation may stop as soon as it's been determined that there is no crime committed. And if the investigation continues and the equipment is not determined to be a cause, usually further investigation of the equipment stops. This is an important point. Even when a manufacturer is not a part of the problem in an accident, we may discover mitigations if we have access to the data or from to the, to the analysis. Um, another reason is that uh, the first responder often has limited information on how to process the scene. And I'm hoping that, that what was done with RISA, that uh, to make sure all the manufacturers have protocols for accident investigation, that we can start to fix that problem anyway. In many countries, the data that's collected is privileged or becomes privileged at some point in the investigation. Even though it might save lives in the future, it's unlikely to be shared. And another is the culture of blame. If the goal of the investigation is to find fault so someone can be blamed, there's little initiative for an impartial investigation. Even open discussion becomes careful if you're worried about or considering it being made public or possibly even showing up in a court. Dive buddies protect themselves and their friends, and sometimes the buddy doesn't want to be analyzed. The number of rebreather deaths and the number of re oh, I saw, so, so even if I could, though, wave my magic wand right this minute, instantly the world has changed and, and we have all the accident data. The number of rebreather divers and the fatalities that are associated with them is still so small that it would be very hard to, to make any sort of statistical predictions based on the small data set. So we really are still going to require significant synthesis for the manufacturers to perfect mit mitigations. And again, as a manufacturer, I would like to see root cause analysis so that we can more easily figure out what happened and what we need to do to stop it. And of course, I realize this is unrealistic. Um, in most of the accidents that have occurred, we will never know which of the possible events was the actual event. But the future can be different. With these limitations in mind, I'll make an attempt to present some opinions for improving rebreather safety. I don't have any special knowledge here and, and uh, listen with, with interest to the, the progression of the sensors, but uh, this is just some of my opinions. One of the uh, one of the developments that, I've, that I should mention is the move to digital communications and rebreathers, and others have talked about that. Virtually all rebreather manufacturers are producing systems now that use digital communications, from serial communications for displays to SDLC, CAN bus, and fiber optics. Digital, digital communications are part of modern rebreathers, and there's good reasons for this. There are several advantages to systems uh, of, of digital devices rather than uh, a centralized system. When digital systems are broken down into multiple devices, an immediate benefit can be simplicity. Instead of having one processor that does everything, tasks can be separated. For example, one processor can manage O2 injection while another manages the user interface device. Processing power distributed through a system allows the signal conditioning and control to be closer to sensors and actuators. These models then communicate over error-controlled digital communication links. As this design develops, it's, it's easier to create standardized interfaces that allow field repairs, device upgrades, and future functionality, optional functionality. There can be a lot of flexibility. New levels of redundancy and monitoring are available as modules become autonomous and mutually suspicious. Capability of micro, microcontrollers and low-cost static memory has improved immensely over just the last decade. It is now possible for low-cost and low-power devices to process and store large amounts of data. As rebreather electronic designs get refreshed, we will see much more dive logs. And, and I'm happy to say that uh, 
that the new version of the Revo Electronics with uh, Dan Workhander's technology on it also now has a black box. Uh, it will it'll be common to see comp comprehensive diagnostic logs from the time of power up till the time of power down. With this data and expert knowledge, it should be possible to reconstruct dives with much more accuracy and provide better narrowing of, of possible root causes. But for, there's another side for this issue, another common theme. For this data to be useful, it needs to be shared with the manufacturers. At, pre <coughs> at present, it may not be possible for data to be actually used. Some investigative bodies, as we've said, uh, uh, are mandated not to share data. In some cases, data has been shared inappropriately because there's no particular information about how to handle it. And sometimes, in fact, I think often, the data is not collected at all. If it is important for us to reduce fatalities and improve mitigations with the tiny amount of data that we have available, we need to create a way to collect, store, and analyze data in an impartial setting. I believe that a system modeled on a medical morbidity and mortality panel is the best solution available. We don't need to know as manufacturers what the names of the people were or, or even what kind of rebreather it is. All we need to know is what the outcomes were and what the causes were. The issue of appropriate handling of data after an incident needs to be addressed in a comprehensive way for the industry to move forward on an optimal path. I think all the production level rebreathers on the market now can be dived safely. I believe that most of the problems occur in the way that divers interact with rebreathers and that by improving the interaction we can improve safety. In an article published in Underwater Technology, researchers at Cranfield University created a fault tree analysis to identify root, uh, root causes, uh, um, to identify risk in rebreathers. It categorized the events leading to unconsciousness, unconsciousness and drowning into these categories. Although the exact categorization of the occurrences is open to interpretation, it is clear that the diver has a large role in the vast majority of these outcomes. Even if their analysis is close, it's clear that human factors need to be a serious part of safety design. A phrase that is familiar in many technological fields is the mental model of the automation. In order to operate any device, it is important to understand how that device works and what operations are possible with it. For a shovel, it's clear from just a visual inspection. But if we move on to the devices only slightly more complex, it's easy to confuse us about function. This is a picture of a door handle. And the fact that it has a handle rather than a plate would lead most people to think that they should pull this door rather than push it. So the designer has solved that problem by putting the word push on it. The part of the design that gives us uh, subconscious hints on how to uh, <coughs> on how to use devices is called affordances. Affordances tell us how to use things, and some of them are fairly obvious. Buttons can be pushed and switches can be switched. So I had a picture on there of a coffee urn with coffee all over the table. And I got that picture just uh, the day before I left. I, on, on Tuesday, last Tuesday, or this Tuesday, I was at a meeting. I go to a monthly meeting of manufacturers and each of these 10 people that I go to the meeting with uh, owns a manufacturing company of approximately the same size as Shearwater Research, and we do you know, team coaching sort of things. I watched three people in a row walk up to the coffee machine, push the button, pour coffee on the table, wipe the coffee out. Second guy, third guy. Three people in a row put the coffee cup in the wrong place. Each of these guys owns a manufacturing company. You know, you could say that's user error, but I think no. I mean, the, the affordances are wrong. The, the, the visual cues on this coffee urn cause you to put the coffee cup in the wrong place, and we need to be aware of things like that. With computerized systems, the affordance are, affordances are harder to create. Many human errors are actually errors in design. We have many choices about how to imply function, and I'll offer one example here. About 10 years ago, we needed to create a mental model for a system that allowed five open circuit gases and five closed circuit gases. Gases could be entered and selected. 
but only one set of gases could be act active at a time. That is, you're either on open circuit or closed circuit, and if you're on open circuit, you have open circuit gases available. Trying to find an understandable mental model for this set of variables and operations confounded me for months. I'd already changed the design and rewritten the code once, and I was still unhappy. One night I was on the phone with Tracy Robinette, who was uh, at a pre uh, one of the organizers of the previous one, describing my frustration. And he had an idea. And he said, that sounds an awful lot like a car radio. And it's, it's that, that's a really good example. So now that you have this transfer of training, this is called, I can in a very few minutes explain how, explain how our gas systems work and you can even figure out how parts that I don't explain to you are going to work because you already know how a car radio works. So Gordon Smith was, a, was, a, was against alarms. Gordon was an interesting guy. I don't know how many of you people talked to him. Interesting guy to talk to. He was against alarms and recommended manual rebreathers with no automatic set point. As I mentioned earlier, there's a group of researchers that believe that seatbelt laws may encourage faster driver, or seatbelts may, may encourage faster driving. The implication is that every time manufacturers create safer systems, divers will engage in riskier behavior to maintain risk homeostasis. His stated belief was that if there's no alarms and no set point maintenance, the diver would have a high level of perceived risk and not become complacent. I mean, it sounds very extreme, but so far, manual rebreathers are at least as safe as the electronic ones. The reason I mention this is that it's far from clear which mitigations and designs are going to yield the safest, safest rebreathers. There are many people working on rebreathers and electronic systems, and they differ significantly. Each of them is doing it with the best of intentions. But no one knows which design is better. Um, I'm just going to change the subject a little bit here, is that I, I um, did some manufacturer interviews. When I first got this task, I thought I'd go around and you know, ask manufacturers what I should talk about in, in regards to information systems for rebreathers, and I didn't end up with a lot of useful information that I ended up in the presentation, but some interesting ideas on what people are thinking. They, 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 I just asked some unstructured questions, so I don't have any survey answers or anything like that. But Big surprise, everyone was in favor of checklists. But everyone had a different way of how to do checklists. There was one checklist, two checklists, forced, optional. The only consensus was we should be using checklists. CE certification didn't do as well as I expected. There was only one unreserved positive vote. Others had issues with political nature of the standard or with uneven application of testing. One person mentioned creating an ISO standard. A dive data recorder was very popular with only one vendor who didn't think that was a good idea. Do we have too much automation? Answers are all over the map, from too much to not enough to just enough. Alarms were popular, but I was encouraged that several people said it's very tricky to get them right. So what are the biggest problems? I guess you know we're already seeing that here. CO2 sensing and accident investigation were the two biggest issues for the manufacturers. Uneven training was the highest non-technical issue. My favorite comment was that the industry needed to move on from 60-year-olds writing manuals for 40-year-olds. And of course, the consumer will still make a choice. The best rebreather won't automatically win the race. The history of electronics has many examples of inferior technology becoming the most popular. And the safest rebreathers won't win either necessarily. If safety was the main goal of consumers, everyone would own a Volvo and there would be no such thing as a Lamborghini. Most technical dive computers don't lock out the diver even if she misses decompression. In the recreational industry, a 24-hour or 48-hour lockout is thought to be safer. But a computer that locked the diver out in a tech community would be virtually unsaleable. There will, be, there, will, there will never be a perfect rebreather. So what can we do? We have to find the low-hanging fruit. In my opinion, in my opinion uh, checklists are the best way to improve rebreather safety now. There's ample evidence in many fields that checklists reduce mistakes. 
particularly there's recent uh, uh, medical research is particularly compelling. But in spite of the knowledge that checklists reduce errors, it's difficult to ensure their use. Doctors resist them. Divers resist them. There's a phrase that I hear repeatedly. Build something that is foolproof and they will build a better fool. I think we really need to stop saying that. I think that statement should be banned. Many fatalities are intelligent, skilled, careful divers. On a recent dive trip, I was standing around the deck talking with a couple of people and we were talking about checklists. Well, the three of us all thought that the evidence for positive checklists, uh, the evidence for the positive effects of checklists was overwhelming, a diver walked by and overheard us and offered his comment. He was a retired surgeon and offered the opinion that most surgeons just checked off the boxes and didn't give it much thought. He appeared to believe the checklists were not very useful. The next day, I heard a commotion out on the dock. I ran out there to see what was going on and watched the surgeon being rescued. He had gone unconscious in the water and he was lucky enough to do it near several, several rescue trained people. One of them from the dock spotted him and, and he was rescued. Uh, I have absolutely no doubt that they saved his life. This was a hypoxia incident. He didn't do a checklist. In fact, he didn't even look at his displays. And, and, you know, we can come up with mitigations for this kind of problem. Obviously, there are things you can do. But if he won't even look at his handsets, there's really not that much you can do. A dead battery would, would overcome whatever mitigation you're likely to come up with. This is not a design problem. This is a behavior problem. I think that with most people, Setting up a rebreather becomes a habit or a routine. With practice, the subconscious mind takes over. As we power through the process on autopilot, we miss subtle signals or skip steps if we're interrupted. I think that most people grossly overestimate their ability to notice changes in their environment and underestimate how the subconscious takes over routine sensory work. And I have a DVD here, but this thing can't play DVD, so I'm going to describe the, the DVD. There's a series of tests, and I don't know how many people uh, uh, are, aware, are aware of the video called The Invisible Gorilla. A few. So it's, it's the same group of people. They've done, they did a, a test where they had a person getting instructions, uh, a person getting directions. So one person walks up to the subject and asks for directions. During the conversation, two people walk through with a door in their hands so that the person's vision is cut off for a split second, for a moment. During that time, they switch. So one of the people walking by with the door turns into the person asking for directions. Over half people don't notice they're talking to a different person. And some of them are very surprised that that, that can happen and, and they miss it. But it's, it, it's very common. And the more the more the subconscious or whatever, whatever part of the brain that does that can categorize you, the less likely you are to notice it. So if you dress the person as a construction worker or as a policeman, 75% of them don't notice them changing because they, they've categorized them and the conscious brain is not thinking about that anymore. So I'm, their comments on it, the demonstration illustrates the phenomenon of change blindness. People fail, fail to notice large changes to their visual world when the change occurs during a brief interruption or distraction. In this example, the change was unexpected and occurred during a social interaction. About 50% of the participants failed to notice the change and many expressed surprise. The study shows that people are often of unaware of what transpires right before their eyes and that even seemingly obvious changes do not automatically grab attention. And I think this is a huge justification for check checklists. Um, I like to start with a build checklist when I'm assembling my rebreather and getting it ready for a dive. I go through my checklist. Then I don't have to get on the boat and realize that I have a leak or something like that. I, I regularly find, you know, even excluding the safety part of it, I regularly find little things that are just much easier to fix on the workbench than they are on the boat. I also do a pre-dive checklist with a pre-breathe. And during that pre-breathe, I take a time out. And I look at my buddy and I look at their equipment and think about what we're going to do and do I have everything I need and is my crotch strap done up and, you know, and all those little things. I mean, you're sitting there anyway, you might as well just take a minute. But in my experience, many people don't do checklists. I believe that the most important thing we can do to, as a community to reduce fatalities 
is to make checklists as normal as turning on your gas. We need to make the person who isn't doing a checklist the odd man out. I would like to come back to a point that I made earlier about risk homeostasis. In a presentation I saw recently, an astronaut presented the concept of normalization of deviation. He was talking about the shuttle O-rings, but the concept applies here too. He said that in early shuttle missions, they noticed scorching on the O-rings. Uh, this was not part of the design, and the O-rings were not designed to re resist heat. But they let it go. After a while, it became normal. We all know how that turned out. Divers deviate from what they were taught during their course. They were taught to use a checklist, and I hope did a checklist during, on, during every dive during their course. After the course, at some point, they stop doing their checklists. Then they stop even thinking about a checklist. What they've done is normalize the deviation. They have also significantly increased their actual risk with no change in their perceived risk. Their risk thermostat has the same setting, but they have much higher risk. So we need to take, we need to take advantage We need to take advantage of the data that's available and the data that's going to become available in the future. We need to analyze the accident data. And we need to create a subculture or a culture of safety where showing up without a checklist would be like showing up on the boat naked. In many ways, it's the people in this room that can make this change. And so I hope that you can make the decision to not be a passenger on the bus, but to help drive change. Thank you. We're not used to this, are we? We're used to lineups and the microphones to argue, and just nobody's saying anything controversial, I guess. Ah. Yes, Mark. Make it controversial. Bruce, uh, it's Mark Kenny from Paddy. I agree checklists are vital things. My preference, though, in an ideal world is not to actually give them to divers. I would prefer the machine to do the checking because I think the machine is less likely to make a mistake. Would you like to comment on that? Yes, I, mean, <clears throat> I think that we can do better with machine checklists. I, I think there's a place for them. They won't do everything. And things like a build checklist, I think, is still going to be useful so that you actually, before you go to the boat, you already you know, know pretty much that your system is working. So I, I, I expect that I'll end up, you know, when I have my perfect system, uh, I'll end up with probably something that I'll, I'll use when I'm building and then quite possibly a built-in one as well. Uh, there, there's actually several things that it's very hard for a human to figure out about uh, what's going on in Rebreather that the, the computer could actually do a much better job of it. Hi, uh, Dr. Richard Sadler, Deputy County uh, Medical Examiner up in Iowa. Uh, besides diving being my interest, operating room safety, situational awareness, and checklists are also an interest. I might add for everybody, our own Simon Mitchell co-authored a great checklist paper in the New England Journal of Medicine. He's very modest, but you should go read that. But having said that, and recognizing that the industry does have a problem with risk-taking behavior, has the industry or considered, or is it possible to consider formal human factors training for our divers? Let them understand the limitations that we have cognitively and emotionally, and incorporated it into our training programs. Um, I, I think that's a great idea, and I, and I, I, th it's hard to really know, but I think a lot of people have some sort of, you know, the, 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 the idea of these experienced divers dying, um, I think partly speaks to that, that I think people don't understand how the, the, the cognitive limitations that, that we really have as people that don't affect us in most, you know, if we're, if we're worried about seeing a lion in the bush, our brains work fine for that, but they don't necessarily work that well for uh, computer tasks, for example. Uh, Paul Haynes in the UK. I really, I'd just like to uh, throw out a counter, really, to on the flip side of the coin to Mark there. Um, electronic checklists, yeah, they're extremely useful, but it, that's post-assembly. That's after you've turned the electronics on. That's after you've put the scrubber in and assembled the unit correctly. Whereas a paper checklist, that's pre-assembly. So an electronic system struggle to cope with that, I would, I would propose. 
I'm sorry? Uh, with electronics, uh, electronic uh, pre-dive uh, list will not be able to manage pre-assemble uh, okay. in the rebreather. Yes, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. So there's still a place for check paper checklists, that's my point. Yes, I think there is. I should perhaps just clarify what I meant then in that case. Um, <laughs> what I'm not suggesting is that you can take away the diver component of pre preparing and assembling this machine but I do believe it's possible in the future to develop a system where the machine can self-test to a large degree and replace many of the testing requirements we have on the diver. I think if that can be engineered in, in a reliable way, it will be reliable because divers tend to forget or get distracted. And if we can have the machine self-testing to a large degree, it can improve safety significantly. Yeah, I, and, I, and I, I, I think you're right. I think that the machines can do more, the computers can do more. But you also mentioned another point is that every time you put another sensor on, you increase cost and you know, create another failure point. So I, I think that the industry is going to find a sweet spot in there someplace that, that does catch as many obvious failures as possible uh, while keeping the cost and complexity reasonable. I think. Dick? Uh, Dick Van, Dan America. All right, Bruce. What you say there is kind of motherhood and apple pie. How are you going to make it happen? It's a good question, and actually that question came up at our recent meeting, and, and I'm hoping that we're going to continue to do that. One of the things that, that uh, we came up with just in you know, the, the people sitting around quickly was put a sticker on every rebreather warning about the dangers of diving one without a checklist. I, I hope that we continue this conversation and come, because you're right, I mean, it, it's, it's not enough to wish for it. You have to actually do something to make it change. I think it's partly cultural and I really believe that it's us. It's one of the other things that was suggested during the meeting was just refuse to dive with people that don't do checklists, you know? Leo, I recommend to everybody, if you really want to understand, you know, the logic behind a paper checklist, read a book called The Checklist Manifesto by Atul Gadawandi. It's a magnificent book. But ISC and, uh, you know, a young special forces soldier, combat diver, when I was back in the 80s when I served in the service, the U.S. military used paper checklists as, on a rebreather as simple as a Draeger Lar 5, which is a pure O2 rebreather. And then that was signed off uh, by a dive supervisor. Uh, no bubbles, no trouble. And there were still issues uh, during uh, uh, operations, uh, rebreather failure. But it was all about basically a person lost their attention. They were got up, answered the phone, went to the bathroom, and they didn't sign off where they left off or they weren't using a checklist, and they started off somewhere else and they completely forgot, okay, that they were left that hose disengaged, and so they had a flood. But in the, uh, they saw it just in the in, uh, studies in, in hospitals that used a paper checklist, there was a 60% decrease in the hospitals that were in this study of uh, cross-contamination of MRSA. Uh, it was pretty amazing. And uh, you're going to see, I think, paper checklists, as simple technology as that, is, is uh, it's going to be used more and more in hospitals. That's all I have to say. Thank you. All right. Stefan Franke, um, I'm, I would like to propose an idea for sharing the data. I mean, from what I understood as a, just a normal rebreather diver, in cases of accidents, it's very difficult to share data immediately. Could but, you get closer to the mic? But why would we not try to um, establish a modus where it's easier to share data from non-accidents, like um, as every rebreather is going to collect data in a black box, um, divers could basically um, forward the data to the manufacturer and they would have a community and there would then be automatic programs analyze the data and basically flag out certain things that can be done in an anonymous way where then a diver would get results back and say, here, your pre-dive check um, the on-air millivolt measurements in the sensors were not okay. It, without any judgment whether that was good or bad, but it could be flagged out to the diver so that the situation when you're going to dive and dive and dive over many years that you basically adjust your risk perception to that is from an outside calibrated. There could be an analyze of the um, dive data where you basically would say, yes, that was um, too fast or too slow um, um, descent or ascent. 
um, there was a too high or too low PO2 value or whatever like that, so that the diver would have a benefit providing the data. They would get an analyze of their dive, they could look at that, they could judge that whether that is good or bad for themselves. And the manufacturers in that way or any other organization could collect this type of data and basically at least for non-accidents, because obviously a diver after an accident might not be able to submit data, create a database about dives, maybe as a suggestion. Yes, um, certainly there's, there's, there's value in collecting data. Uh, for me though, I'm much more interested in two areas. Uh, one is uh, I'm very interested in closing the loop on decompression by collecting outcome data from dives uh, online in some easy way and wrapping that back around to the people working on the probabilistic decompression, factoring those numbers in, being able to upgrade algorithms and create basically a closed loop where the experience of divers in the field is continuously improving um, our knowledge of decompression algorithms. And the second part is in terms of incidents, I think it would be very difficult to find the, 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 the resources for a manufacturer like us that has thousands of computers in the field. And if we started getting logs from all these people, I mean, I don't know who would actually look at them. I mean, you mentioned a, a program, I suppose, that could analyze them, but I think that would be a, a pretty tough workload. However, in the case of incidents and close calls, and I think that that might be one of the areas that we could, we could mine much more effectively is is encourage somehow people to talk about their incidents because then we have a witness and we actually know what happened instead of trying to guess which one of the several outcomes is the one that really happened. And uh, so I think in terms of collecting incident data and having, a, you know, spending the time to have a really close look at that would be a great thing. Ken Swain. Yes, uh, expanding on the subject Leon talked about, uh, interruption of checklists. I was doing some quick math in my head a short while ago, and having spent a lifetime in uh, military and commercial aviation, uh, I've done well over 100,000 checklists in my life. Uh, at the, my current airline, we are required by our operations specifications if anything other than the briefest of radio calls comes into the cockpit, we have to start the checklist from the beginning again. Yep. Yeah, it's very easy to get distracted. Uh, Gareth Locke from uh, the UK. I, I spend quite a bit of time uh, and effort going around to dive clubs in the UK talking about human factors and, uh, and the effect that has in the chain. Uh, there's a uh, slide put up by uh, Petar on, on the first day talking about the different layers. And, and the feedback I get from the clubs is it's a no-brainer. Why don't people talk about how, in effect, crew resource management works? Um, and, and again, sort of you ask for the controversial bit, why isn't that sort of adopted in the training? Um, it's been out there for uh, aviation for a while. In medicine, it's there. And I know that uh, there is a couple of guys in the UK looking at putting this uh, into potentially dive training. Um, so the options are out there, but it means that the training agencies need to adopt it in their core material, not a speciality, because it is core capability for those divers. Thank you. Simon? Simon Mitchell, Auckland. Uh, Dick, in answer to your question, I, I think it's quite simple. It's leadership. Effecting change around the use of checklists requires leadership. It's from the top down. So what we've got to start with is the training agencies and their instructors. If they embrace it and they set the example, the behavior will follow. If they see, if students see Phil Short using a checklist or Richie Kohler using a checklist, or any number of the famous divers in here using a checklist, they'll use checklists, they'll embrace it. So that's what it's all about, it's about leadership. Uh, Adam Nussmau from Key Largo. Uh, I run a dive facility down there, and my question would be, what about implementing it from a facility standpoint? I know every diver that comes into my facility has to show a certification card. From a rebreather standpoint, what if a diver comes in the facility to go diving, they have to show a certification card, and then on the boat, they have to show a checklist to the dive master or the captain and, you know, it doesn't cover everybody diving personally, but anybody who's diving at a resort or any sort of facility where there's a crew, that way they can't get in the water until they show a checklist. It helps make them do the checklist, and then on the flip side, if something is to go wrong, we have it sitting right there. I think that's a great idea, that, and, and I think that you could uh, offer quite a bit of protection to yourself as a boat operator by insisting that people do checklists. You might lose some customers, but... Yeah. yeah. <laughs> 
Mark Bryan, High Springs. Uh, back to the data collection, you were talking about it might be difficult to um, analyze all the data unless it was an incident. From the automotive industry, there's a lot of near incidents that um, they try to collect data from. Some like somebody that's uh, you know putting on their makeup or eating while driving, and they swerve. There's no incident. The police are not called, but there's black box data collection, and they relate that to some of those things. I think if you only look at data that involves an incident, you're really missing the items that lead up to that incident. And I think it's very important that one of the things that we do on one of the cave diver forums is there's a, a totally anonymous place where you can go and talk about your near misses because that information is just as important as the incidents, whether they're fatal or not. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I meant by incidents, actually. I, to clarify, I meant near misses, that, that sort of information. Um, Andrew Falk, Melbourne. Richard Harris in the room. Well, um, in Australia for a long time, as well as having Project Sticky Beak, which I talked about earlier today, there's been an ongoing study called the DIM study, which is a diver insulin monitoring um, study. And this was a, a, meant to be an anonymous system, exactly of the type we've been talking about, although it's fallen by the way for in, in recent times, um, largely because the only people who seemed to be responding to it were instructors and um, the data was never properly presented. But Richard is trying to re-establish that and make it electronic um, and integrate that with Dan AP, which of course could be further expanded into Dan USA or whatever other groups. And that would be a, a sort of particular forum for which uh, you know, this type of thing could happen. And certainly, I think in many cases, the near misses are, are actually more important than yeah. some of the accidents. Um, we learn more from the near misses. In the accidents, it's often too late. And having been involved with a lot of accident analysis, it's incredibly difficult to reconstruct what happened after the event. Um, and we particularly, um, I'll give an example, you know, um, we receive a lot of the data, as I mentioned earlier today, that comes across. And despite that, um, sometimes when it comes up to a court case or a coronial investigation that goes into more details, you suddenly get this wealth of other information that will appear out of the woodworks about medical histories or about um, previous behaviour or all sorts of other things that didn't come out in the initial lot of stuff that appeared. But when you have a near miss and the person is self-reporting, they'll often have a much better idea about all the factors that led up to their own accident. So I would encourage other people and um, certainly to Harry, perhaps he could talk about it tomorrow, but um, an electronic central uh, registry for having the near miss accidents would be, um, I would strongly encourage people to participate there. Yep, yep, that's great. Neil Pollock, Dan. Uh, I'm not sure if it was missed, but there are business cards on most of these tables. We have an online uh, reporting system now that's just going live with Dan America for both breath hold and rebreather diving. We're actually trying to expand this to all areas of diving. So you can see those cards. The information uh, will hopefully get out quickly. And it's absolutely true. We never get the full detail in a fatal case. But this will really allow us to learn and provide valuable lessons much faster. So please, if you're interested, uh, take a look. And I hope it will be worthwhile. We're not trying to marry everything across the world because it's a lot easier for multiple people to start things than to coordinate everything. And so we may ultimately come together, but I think right now to have separate systems is not bad. We'll see what works out best. We can all tweak, and we'll eventually come together. Well, I think the session is closed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.